thank you. Uh, I am from Calix, who's um, a couple different local offices. One is just down the street um, here in, in San Jose. And I work out of the office in the North Bay in Petaluma. And um, we obviously are probably well known to most of the service providers as being around for close to 20 years and literally doing pawn for close to 20 years. Um, so we have a probably a different perspective on cord than some of the others in the room. Um, I will start out by introducing myself. I am a solutions architect. I'm not a software architect. I don't have a software engineering degree. Um, I put things together and try and explain them to service providers. And, and so if you ask me about GitHub, GitHubs and, uh, and the like, I'll just kindly defer that to somebody else. Um, the other thing I'm going to do is say some controversial things and hopefully stir up some good questions. Um, so uh, because we do have a perspective, and uh, I think it will resonate with some of the service providers in the room, uh, we'll see. So let's proceed. Oops, i got to remember to hold this up here. So I, broadly speaking, have four topics I want to talk about, which is a little bit of celebrating where we've come, uh, what we've been working on this last summer, um, talk about briefly about an FPGA-based OLT, and we'll have some, you know, we can even stop for questions in there. Talk about, you know, kind of the, really the Calyx, what did we accomplish as a company within this community? And then I'd like to know where you want to go next, not necessarily where I want to go next, because this is a, a service provider-driven initiative uh, in the end. So this is a, accomplishments for the ONF as a group. For the, implement, for the open core implementation for Calyx and, and other vendors as well. So I don't really need to go into this too much. It obviously, we're all familiar with CORD and, and the initiative and the transformation that comes along with, with uh, the network and operations. I think we forget the people side of it uh, as we talk about a transition from a traditional network and into a disaggregated, you know, our, our core architecture. And just think about the thousands or tens of thousands of people who need to be trained uh, on how to operate this network. So we could probably have a separate working group just around how will we train and transition, you know, workforces and companies as we move forward along that path. But nonetheless, I think we have a lot of things to celebrate. I think we can probably all agree on the benefits over there, vendor independence, reduced total cost of ownership, uh, accelerating service uh, delivery uh, in various forms of words that come down to business network or operations, whatever is uh, your priority. And having met with a bunch of service providers, probably some in the room, there's usually one or the others of those that sort of rises to the top in terms of its priority. Whether you have an operations focus or you're trying to change your business and to compete with a, a cable operator in the area or something like that. I'm not a software architect, I draw simple diagrams. So uh, from my perspective, this is an r -cord architecture, right? I've got an orchestrator at the top, I've got r -cord services in the middle, I've got a bunch of hardware and compute and, and I.O. down below. And then, you know, Calyx icons over here, and E9 is our OLT. I will talk about that, and then the ONUs. I think we spend a lot of time talking about disaggregated OLTs. We kind of forget to talk about disaggregated ONUs as well, or ONTs, depending on what you like. But I, I think as um, one of the speakers mentioned there, part of the Volta plug-in driver is an ONU plug-in, not simply an OLT plug-in. So lots of work been going on down there. Um, but I'm not the expert in the room. You are. So I'm just going to talk about the parts that impacted Calyx or that we saw, right? Because there's much, much more to this than, than Calyx ever participated in or that we're even aware of from an architecture perspective. Um, so we'll go ahead and talk about the pieces that I've left highlighted there. Um, and again, I'll simplify it down to my perspective. I was arm's length away from everything that happened. I'm, I'm reading emails from the labs every day. I get the virtual experience of, of what's going on through emails. Um, but it's easy to see the, why we're doing this, right? Anybody who's ever worked with service providers looking to back office integration, has seen the time, the extended time it takes to integrate into back office. You know, 18 months, $10 million. You know, there's a, there is a high priority of, of standard, standardizing the northbound interface. And so we're looking at sort of the option to 
inter interface once, do that integration once, and decouple everything down below. And then likewise, all the plugins. And again, Calyx brand, don't worry, that's the OFX for us. Uh, Calyx likes to brand everything, so we have uh, branded our plugin into the Volta. Um, specifically within the open source community, we contributed you know, in those objects in the circle. Primarily, we spent a lot of time, uh, and our contributions rotated, uh, revolved around uh, ONT and OLT software management, ONT auto registration. Uh, we, we intend to bring more to that. One of the things Calyx has done for a decade is allowed um, remote ONT registration ID. You take any ONT off the back of the truck, you plug it in, uh, and when techs used to carry butt sets, uh, you could plug in the phone, dial in the account code, and walk away. Um, and that sort of zero touch uh, decoupling from the serial number, from the FSAN serial number, was a boon to our service provider customers. You know, it, it, and, and that level of automation, I think, is something we want to drive into Volta, uh, decouple having to do inventory management on the truck. Um, so anyway, I, I'm just to celebrate the things in green check marks again. These are where we really saw our contribution or things we tested in the lab. We didn't do much in the way of Volta high availability. Others of our partners and the like did so. Likewise, we spent a lot of time in the labs. Um, we actually were in two labs. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But well, we spent a lot of time working with Onos, the other half of this. We tend to say Volta all the time, um, not, uh, not giving enough attention to the, the controller and the tenant apps running in Onos. Um, so coming out of the labs, both labs, to my knowledge, we were able to execute on IGMP proxy, DHCP relay, and 802.1x. Um, and if anybody has not spent time on multicast, it's not easy. Um, and I hate to say it, but we've only just gotten started. It's going to get a lot harder. Um, right now, we're doing multicast off of a switch into a, into a switch or traffic management, Kumran and the previous conversations down to the Mac. Now let's add in a midstream GFAST DPU, and now let's add in an RG at the, at the base or a modem. So you have four cascaded levels of multicast that need to be, to be set up in there and managing those multicast tables and forking the IGMP messages, um, and there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm really happy that Calyx and, and our partners were able to, to show that in the labs this fall, um, DHCP and 802.1x also. I think there probably is a very healthy response in this room to the open source community, ONF, and, and our projects here. But I'd also like to stop and give time, uh, give some attention to our partners. We went into, again, two labs, one with Radisys as our system integration partner, and one with Sienna as our integration partner. Um, so these are commercial, pro commercial companies on the bottom row. We're all dedicating resources, and I think we got a lot out of it. Um, but Calyx would have been nowhere without Radisys and Sienna acting as our system integrators and, and doing a great job. So I think that's probably lost in our conversation today is this great big role that the Radisys and Sienna played in, in pulling this together from, again, from our perspective. There are other integrators out there. Okay, I guess that was sort of the, the celebration, what we've done from our perspective again. We were gonna talk about some FPGA-based OLTs Again, I've simplified everything, and I think, Sean, you just mentioned there is a contribution uh, up on the server right now for a 24-port based, ba based FPGA, FPGA-based OLT. I'll say that. Um, I've simplified it way down, and I think the comment from uh, Edgecore, again, was, what are the objects that have heat sinks on them? Those are the big ones you got to pay attention to. The rest is kind of in the noise when you look and pull out a line card in our system or open up a 1RU device. Um, so an FPGA-based OLT, as it says, I've got four green boxes down there. Um, it's an FPGA. You can program them to do anything you want. You know, we have going back, we've got BPON, GPON, NGPON, XGSPON, EPON, 10 gig, well, 10 gig EPON, it's just flavors of any pawn loaded up on a Xilinx FPGA. And so we trade off uh, flexibility for the fact that we can load up and have 
pretty much in any PON implementation by changing the firmware if needed. Um, traffic management and switch, well, there was a discussion of Qumran, uh, I can say that. Um, the other things that we've not talked about so much, CPU uh, memory and the timing subsystem, all of our CPUs are x86 based, so we're basically building in a, a VNF infrastructure for all of our products. We've not necessarily loaded it up and using it right now, uh, but the time will come where we say, what can we do with that x86 host? What have we not thought of in advance that some of the service providers in the room want to be able to load up that we need to have locally? And so we have made that switch to x86-based hosts uh, for that reason. Um, and the timing subsystem, uh, not to be made light of. Uh, again, Calyx has been doing this for a while. We've lived through the horrors of trying to do a timing distribution over an asynchronous pond, uh, where the, the basically a boundary clock function has to be worked out between the ONU and the OLT because they're, there's a time lag between them. Uh, it's not as simple as um, doing um, uh, timing over, over a packet. So, those, and then there's a little bit other stuff that I generally call uh, popcorn or you know, the rest of the stuff. We don't put power supplies on our cards. That's, you know, we're sort of you know, traditional telco kind of design. We have dual uh, DC input on the backside. We distribute power down, break it down from 48 volts down to whatever the individual chips need. So there's no, there's no power supply failure. There's nothing on here that's not needed uh, for a telco implementation. So, What's the difference between what I drew and what uh, Jim and, and uh, Jay, not Jay, Jim and Kim, Jim and Kim, thank you, drew in terms of a picture, you know, we have a Broadcom ASIC and it's SDK. We have a Xilinx FPGA and my firmware. Um, the previous pictures drew those as red. Uh, I would say they're black, right? Black proprietary, and as anybody who's mixed paint uh, knows, you can add as much white to the black paint as you want, it's still gray. So I don't know that I would say that one thing is a white box because it's a Broadcom chipset, and the other is a gray box because it has a Xilinx FPGA and uh, firmware on it. That seems to me semantics, um, but functionally, they're the same. Um, so we'll let that one rest. You can ask me questions later. <laughs> But you know, so, if we're really the same, why did Calyx have an FPGA on our OLT? Um, and we'll answer that question. But to even cut, cut out my own legs, we're not married to the FPGA. If Broadcom sales reps were in the room, they'd know that every time we go through a development cycle, they come in, we look at the pros and cons, and we make a decision, should we stick with the FPGA or should we not? Um, right now, we're on an FPGA partly because we've been doing it for 20 years. And we've figured out all the problems with our own firmware, and we've fixed as many as we can find. Um, that allows us to tune the FPGA, the DBA algorithms, the latency, the, um, you know, we are MEF certified for services over the pond. We've done timing distribution over the pond, multicast. We've invested a lot of time in that firmware, and Broadcoms may be better at some point. We may make the switch. But right now, we kind of tuned it and we get a lot of value out of that firmware. So is that bad or good? That's simply the way it's been, and we have a, a heritage of using that. Flexibility. Uh, somebody made the comment about, boy, you got a problem, you call um, Broadcom, you know, you get on their list of features added. Um, you're not very forgiving to us when we need to develop a new feature, AT&T or DT or anybody who looks at us and says, we need this new feature, got this thing going on. We want to be able to step down and fix and change our firmware. And that's part of why we do that is because we have the control straight down in. And it probably goes to the question we had earlier about wanting to have access to the Qumran. You know, because when the time comes, you want to be able to go in quickly and make that change and not get on the roadmap for BAL or for a license agreement hold up between what's going on. So we've leveraged that time and time over again. It's not necessarily uh, a winning argument. It's just something that we leverage. 
I kind of mix, I kind of blended those two together. So um, it is that same idea that we leverage the flexibility of the Xilinx FPGA to have our destiny in our own control. And you can almost map the words of Cord and Volta into what I'm showing you. I don't want vendor lock-in no more than AT&T does. I want to be able to go in and control my own destiny on my FPGA and on my, my Pond Mac. So we have the same objective in mind when we use an FPGA. The last is, it's our business. We take one FPGA and one firmware and use it everywhere. And we have office solution, central office cabinet, pole and strand mounted. We meet compliance on a global basis with NEBS and, and ATIC and, and CTIC in, in Australia, CE in Europe. And we come because that's our business and you hold us to it. We can't get in the lab. We have to go through Verizon's extended list of NEBS certifications or safety certifications. And that's our business and it's part of why we do this because we can put a larger FPGA or a smaller one or an iTemp FPGA that goes out and hits, again, I, I, since you're here and you're so kind, I'll keep picking on you, 75 degree cabinet require, temperature requirements because you serve Arizona, uh, where it gets pretty, no, not, I'm sorry, not, not Arizona, um, Texas. Texas, yes. And so they're like, oh, so design that FPGA, that system to, to go to 10 extra degrees. Um, and so sometimes we hit those requirements and we have to go to exotic lengths to meet them and we can do that with the flexibility uh, that comes with it. So some check marks again, this summer we spent time with you know, NEB certified E9, it's a two RU system. This is our, our methodology generally is hot swappable line cards. So you put in a two RU chassis and you have hot swappable cards you can take out at any time. You don't have to call an electrician to change that out. You call anybody over to pull and, and slot, uh, pick a card off of uh, um, your uh, inventory, your spares list. Uh, so we, we believe in hot swa swappable hardware. Two cards in chassis is simply just a way to do some nice housekeeping management of fan trays and power supplies and LEDs and management ports. But they operate independently uh, from a cord perspective. Likewise, we could have showed up with this 80 pound uh, extruded aluminum cabinet. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Are you going to mention anything about energy efficiency because you're mentioning it on the slides? I do, oh, and I, I mean, I didn't come loaded with some real numbers, but this is a good example. We put, in, we choose uh, the Xilinx tuned FPGA, so we have two-port FPGA in here for this system, which is out uh, pole-mounted. Uh, Ariel gets full sun incidents on it. There's no cabinet to help cool it down. We've got larger FPGAs in here. So we're not, it's, the reason I mention it is just because it's an extra thing we can choose when we put together a line card or a module that goes into one of these. We're not, um, we're not constrained by what we get from Broadcom, for example. We, we have a choice of a whole family. We can pay extra for a more efficient uh, heat uh, or power packaging from, from Xilinx. So you don't have exact numbers to say, well, your FPGA, the biggest one consumes 40 watts. Not with me. I'd have to go. I'm happy to get some information to you. I just don't have it with me. But um, yeah, and the EU's got uh, so a good set of requirements. Uh, I can't remember what they're called, but there's requirements for reducing power over time that we've, yes, exactly. So I, I'm familiar with those. I haven't looked at them in a couple of years, but part of why we do that. Of that MPU, that's the OU, right? It's not OLT? These are all OLTs. Yeah, this is 16 ports per 1RU card. This is four OLT ports per half RU cards. You get 16 in an outdoor hardened uh, system. And this is four, um, four OLT, 10 gig OLT ports in two port modules. The same OLT adapter works with all of them. Exactly. It's the same FPGA code, it's the same feature set across all of them. Now, I'm sure somebody will prove me wrong and we have to tweak the adapter, but that's sort of on a day or two level of effort, not a, a different adapter model. Yep. I didn't, I'm not watching my time. Is somebody else watching my time? All right. So again, we, 
that we come at it with a different, different world perspective uh, on this. Let me finish off with what did we accomplish? And I even filled in your, your expression right now. You're supposed to go, uh, learn what, what all the green check marks were. Um, but we, we really accomplished something different um, from our perspective again. Uh, if any of, us, any of you have met with Calyx, you know that and read the numerous press releases, we have an operating system we call AXOS. Um, it is, it's, it, it, you know, structurally, you can look at management, uh, north, uh, northbound APIs, modular software control and, and data in the middle. It looks like a modern software architecture, right? Not that different from Onos or Open Daylight or just about any other modular software architecture. Um, what it does for us, though, um, it allows us to have individual components that we can turn on and off and load up with a different software distribution. You don't like my version of IGMP? Great, I'll leave it out. Um, we can use the one that's up in the Onos controller. Um, it's all sandwiched between um, above a hardware and service abstraction layer. So Kim's conversation about what's doing, been done with BAL, uh, we call ours a, a HAL and a SAL. But they accomplish effectively the same. I'll show you that on the next page. Um, part of our connector, and the, and the reason why it was somewhat relatively easy, is every object in the system is Yang modeled. I don't have to. I don't have to do any translation, or twiddle anything, and just pump the Yang Yang object northbound uh, into our connector. So it made that relatively easy uh, for our connector. Again, this picture is, I just put it up because it, it tells a story of what we've done. We've disaggregated ourselves, right? The last conversations, a couple of conversations about disaggregated OLTs, we did that a couple of years ago. Um, and so we have built in to our software a pretty hard line hardware abstraction layer. Um, above it is all those software modules we talked about with API calls. Below it are SDKs from Broadcom and Marvell and Scipio and our own FPGA. And any vendor we work with, um, merchant chipsets, are below our HAL. So just like you can swipe through you know, songs on your iTunes, you can swipe through NGPON2, you can swipe through GPON, we have a VDSL version. I could you know, whatever comes next, a VDSL um, profile 35B, and we can load it up on generic white box hardware if we take the time to write those, those drivers down below. And this is exactly the conversation you were just having, right? It's a complex SDK when you get into the Qumran or when you get into uh, the Maple. That's, that's our life as making a systems vendor and a hardware. We take on what looks like the Volta adapter, doesn't it? Well, that's, we've done it to ourselves by reaching down into the silicon chipsets below us. So I'm not married to my hardware. If you bring me a better set of hardware, I'll take a look at it. Calyx would happily take a look at saying, your OLT, your remote hardened DPU is better than ours. We'll take a look at that. We're not married to it. The integration is really at the software level and less so uh, married to the hardware. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Yep. So where is Volta at this point? Volta's not, Volta's on this diagram. Volta on this diagram is up in Volta. This is embedded software riding around on the DPU or the OLT or um, any of the gear that's okay, so in the field. It's, it's embedded within the hardware. Right, the, the, the diagram that, um, I should have memorized everybody's names better. Um, Jeff was showing the software layer of, that goes on the edge core devices. This is our version of it. Um, you know, we don't have a Broadcom, we don't have a BAL. We have the Calyx XOS at, uh, abstraction layer. Um, so we're using, using a very similar architecture on ourselves that uh, BAL is solving on the, uh, the edge core device. That makes sense? But this is definitely all on the OLT itself. And the reason, I'm getting, I'll get to the, to the punchline, the reason we do this will be evident in a minute, um, because we can turn on and off all those functions. Right? We're, not, we're not forcing anybody to use them, but um, let me go on and answer the question by illustrating it on the next slide, I think, if that's okay. So this is why we do it. 
This was two minutes. This is why we do it. Because 99.99% of the network looks like this right now uh, with a router, an OLT, and ONUs. And this is how we're building our networks today in various forms and for form functions. And we're racing along, pushed by all the service providers to build these networks. Go fast, 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 build out your network, right? And so our perspective is not how do we build our court, it's how do we tra transition to our court. Why don't you let me build this out and then I'll get to you, right? So when we remove the router, which is what we all agree we want to do, and insert um, ONAP, I'm sorry, insert ONOS and Volta, we add the connector, OFX, into Volta. We, we change the open flow down here, but the hardware doesn't change. It's the production shipping hardware that's running your network today. Um, we don't change anything other than going into the software and changing the distribution. No different than what you do in Onos with tenant apps. You just get rid of them and you have a different distribution. We skinny it down and suddenly our uh, AXOS distribution looks a lot like the, the distribution on the edge core product. We've gotten rid of control and management and now we just have some northbound APIs. But if you wanna do diagnostics and things that aren't in Volta currently, you can still get to all that functionality down in the OLT. So that's, again, this is, this is our business. We're selling this row to service providers globally right now. And the question is, how do I get to this without walking away from the millions and millions and millions of dollars that are, that are running the network? So anyway, I'm done. Uh, you have a question, yes. Need to be done with that, so okay, I've reached my time limit, and, and I'm holding you back from from. Yeah. So what I understood then, principle. It's almost an onboard equivalent of Onos, if you will. I mean, it's it's a blend because I've got control protocols in here and management functions. Simultaneously, I mean, let's let's face it. It's 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 a, you can take an E9 out of the cardboard box, screw it in the rack, and turn it on and connect the fibers and run your network. So it's a self-contained everything in there. There is a CLI, there is an OMCI stack, there is everything you need to be out of the cardboard box and run your network because that's how 100% of the networks right now are built. But what cord and open cord, what we're doing is saying cross that one off, cross that one off, cross all these things off because they're now migrating up into Onos and Volta. Right. And so we would take this one and put it on uh, any white box? And, uh, we can. We can take this piece and, and the things that you want and start to layer them down. I haven't done it yet. Um, frankly, there's no one has asked and no one said, this piece of hardware is better than yours. Let's go ahead and do it. But, and, but we're willing to do that. We, we've said that very publicly. What actually benefit uh, could a service provider have um, when, when you run it uh, additionally through Volta, right? Because Volta does an abstraction. Um, you probably don't get a lot of benefit if you had an entirely purple network. And I would love it if you had an entirely purple network, right? A Calyx purple boxes. But I know your network has six different vendors from five different generations of systems in it. And so Volta harmonizes and centralizes it. So we might all support IGMP but we use blacklist, somebody else uses whitelist, somebody have you know, all the different policy around it. To me, that's what Volta is bringing in, is the standardized policy and management and control functions that you don't get um, even from a single vendor consistency, let alone three or four vendors that you bring in. I, I'm, I love the Volta concept because it standardizes and harmonizes and makes it easier for me to get into your network, because, you know, Right? I, I want to be able to show up and, and, and compete on a level playing ground. Mm -hmm. So Volta for you is the principle uh, in game, uh, governmentalizer, so it's like a uniform. <laughs> it, it, it harmonizes the Yang model, it harmonizes the open flow interfaces, and it allows me to have a thin, skinny distribution that meets your needs. And I can be there, and, and it's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm built for. I don't have to go design something. I went, to, I went. Okay, yeah, so I think we're in a coffee break right now, so let's please thank the speaker. Um. <laughs>